It's kind of a dumb animal, uh, isn't it? Oh, hilariously dumb. Like you can see, find it. You can find hours and hours of videos online. Just <laughs> I've seen pandas falling out of trees, breaking, snapping bamboo, and just like falling to their their early death. Klutzy pandas. <laughs> Okay, thanks for tuning in to the Redacted Podcast. I'm your host, Matt Bender, and um, we got a guest here on the show today that worked at and knows quite a bit about uh, what what you would call, I think you said it was a private roadside zoo? Uh, actually, Matt, it was a non-profit roadside zoo. Non-profit. Uh, quite literally. Okay. It was quite literally on the uh, side of the freeway. You could see it from the freeway, from the interstate. It's quite literally a roadside zoo. That's kind of crazy. I don't know if I've ever seen anything like that. Is it, um, did it have buildings? I mean, obviously. It was like a permanent structure, right? Oh, yes. Yes and no, actually. The, okay. The, the whole history of, of, of the location, it's gone, it's, it's had so many iterations of different sort of things, uh, like what it was before a zoo, like before it was a zoo, it was a brothel, before a brothel, it was sort of like a correctional halfway house. Holy you know shit. I mean? Holy shit. Yeah. A brothel, but, uh, a brothel turned into a zoo. It, it, it's like two different things. Exactly. It just wow. had so many different sort of life, life cycles. And it ended up being a zoo uh, about 30, 40 years ago. Uh, but I didn't get into it until I was a high schooler. Um, this yeah, roadside zoo... You got in in high schools when you started working there? I did, yes. Um, somewhere around high school, we were required to have community service hours sort of logged so we can graduate with a, another diploma. And uh, I didn't know what to do, but I saw nearby where I lived was an animal sanctuary, something beautiful and out, out and about. And I applied there and they instantly uh, denied me. But here was this nonprofit roadside zoo that immediately took me in. <laughs> oh, wow. So they just. Uh, so I started. Uh... And that, and that sounds so weird, like a nonprofit roadside zoo. Like, um, it, it does paint the picture, but yeah. And were you kind of like, well, what the heck is this about then? Was it, was it oh, weird absolutely. or were you excited or were you like, is it like a tourist thing? Oh, it's absolutely a tourist attraction for the town we were in. Okay. Um, and it's, when I got there, I was immediately sort of like confused. Like, this is a zoo. You wouldn't expect it to be a zoo. It's just a big building. And you see a sign that just says the word zoo on it. <laughs> Nothing else. And it's sort of old and decrepit because of how old it is and how little money they had to spend on renovations. That didn't involve the animals. So immediately off, off, off the out the gate, I was sort of, you know, having my reservations whether or not I wanted to work, work there or volunteer there. And the staff didn't make it any better. They were kind of like... Uh, not hicks, I'd say, but they weren't like, uh, you know, sophisticated zookeepers. They were just people who are passionate about animals and just love animals in general. So they worked there for years and they have all the experience they need. But I wouldn't call them zookeepers. I would just call them experienced animal handlers. Yeah. So the the looks were a little deceiving because you're you're maybe thinking you're going to see these people like you saw on a Jack Handy or, you know, something, you know, the, a, a zoo shirt and some kind of a college background and then. You know, this th this wasn't quite that. Absolutely, it wasn't that. I expected to see those like khaki shirts and yeah. khaki shorts. They you see every zookeeper the, classically the wearing safari. These guys had the safari outfit. Exactly. Yeah. The safari look. Yeah, these guys didn't have that. They had uh, you know t shirts with jeans on. It was more like a but, Tiger um, King style. Oh, actually, Tiger King is is, is a, such a common occurrence in different parts of the country, and we were no different. We were similar in a lot of different aspects. Thankfully, we didn't have the gun toting, you know, uh, I don't know, the guy who was running for president or anything. We didn't have those sort of ambitions. We kept to ourselves. We were a small, tight knit community. Okay. And you, you say there's a lot of that that goes on. 
there's a lot of yeah, like kind of nonprofit, right. like I and I, I've seen a lot of big cat stuff, like specifically. Exactly. Uh, there, so here's the crazy thing. In, in every state, there are different. In every city, there are different regulations for like having wild exotic animals, whether they're whether they're native or whether they're endangered. You can have it with sort of like the right paperwork and the right accreditation. But there are hundreds of roadside zoos that aren't even nonprofit. Ours was ours was a nonprofit, but not everyone is. Usually, they're cash grabs or schemes where they you know let you take pictures of kittens of tigers, and it's like the tiger scene aesthetic, and like. There are like the WWF. I forgot the. It's like an organization that sort of like works on the. You know, it's sort of. Uh, yeah. It's yeah. The World, World Wild Wildlife Fund Foundation. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, exactly. A blanking there. Wrestling had to Those give guys. it up because of them. <laughs> Wrestling used to be the WWF, and then they had to go to the WCW. That makes or sense. WWE, yeah. I think too. Yeah. Crazy. Well. It's crazy because the WWF, they estimate that there are at least 10,000, like, tigers in captivity. Those are just tigers. I'm not including lions, lynx, leopards, uh, you know, all the other crazy cats out there. But there are 10,000 tigers in the United States. And under five less than 5% of them are even in accredited zoos and sanctuaries. Most of them are just privately owned, uh, whether they are purchased illegally. And you really can't purchase tigers illegally. There's a whole, like, Endangered Species Act that like, the, prohibits you from purchasing, you know, exotic animals that are endangered. And the way zoos function is they trade between themselves like, through, uh, through the uh, whole accreditation. You know, uh, zoos sort of work together, like San Diego and, and yeah. the other guys. I yeah. can't think of any other big zoos. It's like reciprocal. It's absolutely it's reciprocal. It's sort of uh, promoting a, a, a ethical breeding program to help boost the numbers in, in, in the wild. Like some, like uh, San Diego will take in some pandas and then they'll breed them and then they'll send them back, or they'll take in some cheetahs. Same thing. And or they'll take like orphaned animals in the wild, you know, rehabilitate them, and then uh, if not, if they're trying to release, you know, back where they came from, they'll just keep them on their collection and just trade them around for years. But it's all ethical and it's all nice and it's sort of like all documented. It's very neat. We were not that as a nonprofit zoo. We had to worry about you know money and how, how we could feed the animals, how we could keep the, the, the lights on the build lights on because you know, we we're paying for the land. It was sort of a struggle from day one, from, from me getting there. And you were taking, I assume this place was taking either donations or, you know, like an entrance fee from people who wanted to come and see it. And that was a primary source of revenue. It was their only source of revenue. All they had were t uh, ticket sales and donations from the, from the community. And donations didn't just come in money. Most often enough, you'd see like donations being in the form of you know, feed or raw meat, if you had extra raw meat. Uh, actually, I, I worked uh, to get an account who like sells wholesale meat frozen, and they had a batch that was not safe for human consumption. And I remember we got like a cargo container's worth of like raw uh, venison, raw, I think turkey, but mostly venison. And so that was a huge deal for us, getting like oh, yeah. a cargo container full of just, you know, boxes of meat that we can't eat, but the animals wouldn't have an issue eating. Well, that's, that's, and that's good to see that it's, that it gets used, um, to something beneficial. And I'm sure that, I mean, if you're talking about, you know, big cats and these big animals and stuff, I mean, they, they put down some chow, man. They, they need a oh, lot. They do. I don't know what it is, but I've just, from things I've seen, like the, the amount of pounds or something that they eat in a day is, is ridiculous. Yep, they eat like five, to, depending on the size of the cat, from five to 10 pounds of meat. And that's every day, maybe minus one or two days so they can fast. Because in, cap, in captivity, you can't just feed them every day. Yeah, yeah. They typically, in the wild, they don't have food every day given to them. So they have to sort of stimulate the same sort of environment they have, stimulate the same environment they have in the wild in captivity. So almost every day, we'd have to prepare over, over 30 to 40 pounds of meat and then like 20 to 30 pounds of vegetables and fruit. I mean, we weren't a big zoo, but we had a, a wide selection of different animals. Oh. We didn't just have big cats. Yeah, what did you, why don't you walk through, I mean, I know stuff probably changed, but what was the basic kind of lineup of animals? When I got there, we hosted different species from like big cats to small cats to uh, primates, uh, some hoofstuck animal that weren't native to our area. Exotic birds are rescues. Same with the reptiles, like an alligator. I'll get into that in a second. Um, and then we also had hyenas, which are their own little class of, you know, animal animal species. 
we had so many sort of like barn animals sort of next to these exotic animals. We had zebras next to donkeys and we had leopards next to baboons. I guess they're in the same sort of environment, but like it's crazy to see camels next to baboons. It's, we weren't organized by by uh, uh, by geography like Africa or Asia or even by like species like reptiles and, and amphibians. We just had animals wherever they fit, whatever cage was suited for them and was FDA certified, FDA approved. Uh, oh, sorry, F FDA. I don't know. I don't know who regulates that. I'm sure somebody I'm does. I'm thinking USDA. It's the USDA. I'm so sorry. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. Yes, USDA, they have specific guidelines on the enclosure size, the catch cage size, the fences, whether they be one or, or two. And so we just had a mismatch of animals in different areas, and most of them had been there their entire life, whether they were bred there or they were acquired very young in their life. Wow, so they, they knew nothing other than captivity. Yeah, most of them were rescues. Most, uh, the, the, a lot of them had their own unique sort of rescue story or their own purchase story because... 30 years ago, rules and regulations were a lot less strict than they are now. You could easily buy a hyena from a, from a, from an auction in in, uh, in Texas or Missouri. Like those are like huge states for you know tra trading and uh, selling wildlife, you know, or exotic animals. Okay, and and then I imagine I've seen before that some of the places like yours will actually. Uh, come to obtain them from people who illegally own them, and maybe they were seized or something. So that's exactly we have. That's kind of the rescue aspect of it. It is. It's the surrendering of animals that you're not legally allowed to have. We uh, we had an alligator who belonged to a drug dealer, and this alligator was oh, confined wow. to a bathtub. So she was severely stunted in growth. She was a small alligator, and uh, but we took her in, and she's like thirty plus years now. If she's still there at the zoo, I'm not sure where she is now. But, um, you know, we have strange sort of acquisitions from you know, birds to even our tigers. Some of our tigers weren't purchased or even traded. They were just kind of donated to us. Wow. And what was the animal with the, the biggest kind of draw? Like what? I, I imagine it had to be the big cats. Yeah, it, it was it was the tigers and lions when we had them. It was the lions. I mean, we have we always had tigers. Oh, wow. The lions we had for for a while and they, they all passed away from old age, but then we got a new set of uh, lines, but uh, that's later on the story. Um, our tigers, we had two tigers. I won't specify which kind. Uh, they were actually owned by a magician in Las Vegas. Uh, well, I, I won't go into which magician. Yeah, that's kind of, well, okay. Okay, go on. Yeah, the, these, this guy was crazy. He had two tigers, but the issue was one had neurological issues. She wasn't fit for stage time. And she she was too aggressive. She wasn't trainable, pretty much. She, she served no function. So rather than, rather than sell it to someone who wouldn't buy her, you know, they just donated to our zoo, and we had two tigers on exhibit. One with severe, you know, anxiety issues, and but me and her, me and that me and that one tiger, we actually grew a very strong bond. I wasn't sure if it was because of who I was or because of just the amount of time I spent with her. But over time, after hours or before hours, you'd see she wasn't so stressed out. But during hours, that's what you saw. She was not fit to be in a zoo. What was she like, pacing or just acting strange? Or, you know, I'm sure you could tell. Just with all the yeah, people, a lot of different... you know, walking around, little kids screaming and and all that. Exactly. I mean, all these different stress factors from, like, the people, from the music. It's where an extra freeway, so, like, there's a lot of noise. And so having this, you know, tiger and display, and it's not, like I said, it's not a big zoo. So like the distance between you and the tiger is quite, you know, quite small. He could almost reach over to the, to the second fence where the tiger is at. And so she wouldn't eat. She, sometimes she, she would pace a lot and she'd be extra aggressive. Those are all signs of sort of like uh, uh, just stress issues with being, you know, on exhibit. But they knew early on that she just had neurological issues. Okay. And then was the other tiger pretty... Pretty mellow? Was that one a little more <laughs> acclimated? Uh, I'd say he was rambunctious, but he was definitely acclimated. Now, were you guys actually touching these animals or anything like that? Um, or was it kind of all arm's length? So, our because we weren't, you know, an accredited zoo, we didn't have sort of like 
strict rules saying we couldn't or we could. Um, we were pretty much just playing it by ear and by saying, you were, you know, if you were there long enough and if you were safe, you could pet the tigers through the fence or you could hold a capuchin monkey on your shoulder or you can get an enclosure with a hyena. It just depends on the animal and, and the sort of comfort that they have with the, with the, uh, with the zookeeper. A lot of them, a lot of the zookeepers or the volunteers who worked at this nonprofit have been there for at least a decade or more. Okay. And then um, was there ever, ever any issues with the, the volunteers being attacked or maybe harming the animals or something like that? Uh, I mean, uh, myself included, I, I was uh, grabbed by one of the, I was grabbed by, a, I was grabbed by a camel and uh, they wouldn't let go. And then my, my friend thankfully just bopped it on the nose and, they let go, but it's I, I got off easy because a year prior, I mean, a friend of mine, very lanky, small, skinny, she was picked up by the ankle by the same camel. So there had been sort of this documented uh, sort of a case of aggression with this camel. We couldn't go in there alone without sort of like a, a rake or a wheelbarrow to keep between you and the animal. Um, and some animals are, of course, just, you know, they're by nature, they just bite or they scratch. But uh, there are uh, so many animals I get trying to think animals of. can be aggressive I've, I've heard that oh absolutely they're, they're scary they don't just kick backwards they kick to the side too so yeah. wherever you are they could easily kick you yeah yeah okay. yeah that's great and then they um, are camels the one that do that spit thing they like sneeze on you they don't spit on you that's the alpaca that's a pack oh okay okay yeah and, and but camels they just sort of like slobber and they just have a lot of slobber drop you know just dribbling down their face they already have that you know it's a lot of uh uh trying to think of the the, the name of the, spe- the class of species anyways a lot of camels most camel species they just drool just like they normally do um i'm trying to think uh like there were no major attacks like there were no uh, like no one died, no one was mauled to death. Like no one lost an arm, like in Tiger King. The farthest we got was someone lost a finger because uh, we uh, we got as far as we could with volunteers, but it wasn't enough to do all the nitty gritty work, like picking up the the uh, the pen with all the deer for the petting zoo. It's like a lot of poop, and it takes hours of our time to do it, or even just like picking up rocks or cleaning up the general you know paths. So we would often get. You know these people who need to do community service for the you know, for the various things they did you know in society whether they broke a law or they needed for school and so we took in a lot of people who just needed the, the, the to do hours of community service and we gave them the grunt work well this one uh, in, one individual he jumped the secondary fence and then got real up close with the tigers and he was trying to pet the tigers to their fence and he oh, no. lost a finger just because it's the tiger grabbed on, wouldn't let go. And oh, finally, no. the tiger just pulled the finger straight off. Holy cow. Just, I mean, with its mouth, obviously, it just kind of, he's so, sticking his finger in it, trying to touch him. And then the tiger just goes, nap, just yanks exactly. it. Jeez. Were you there? And here's the thing. Oh, I was there, but I wasn't there with the tigers. I just heard of it. Oh, man. I had to run down there. Um, that had to be so painful. <laughs> I can't imagine how painful it was. Just the pulling, right? Because it wasn't oh. like a clean, like, chop. Yeah, yeah. Like, like a like clean a chop pull. sounds bad enough, but like a yank your finger out. Oh, my God. <laughs> can't imagine. Thankfully, we didn't incur any sort of uh, consequences. The tiger wasn't put down. They were just quarantined for a while. Yeah, um, well, that's good. Yeah, there were so many different aspects of, of, of working at a small zoo that just were, weren't sort of pretty. Every day, every week, every year, we were worried we might not have enough money to keep going. There was no game plan for in case we didn't have the money. There was no backup. Like if our aunt, if we didn't have the money to keep the lights on or to feed the animals, we'd have to scramble to sell or even donate our animals to other facilities in the nearby states because our 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 area didn't have any zoos. We were the only zoo. And it's like it was like living paycheck to paycheck. Yeah, that's kind of tough. Like a constant cloud of worry. And I mean, that probably means that the animals, I mean, were the animals getting everything they needed or I'm sure there had to be shortcuts. Um, I, I'm thankful I can report that there were no actual shortcuts, ones that endangered the animals or put them in sort of like a, a weird spot. We were never negligent. We were always 
putting in the extra hours, working 50, 60 hour weeks just for free. Sometimes, I mean, eventually, I never told you actually how I got started there, really. I mean, after I started working there as a, as a volunteer in high school, I quickly loved it and eventually kind of went up the ranks and started working there. And so, I mean, eventually I was being paid, but I was being paid very little because we just didn't have the funds. But when I was being paid to be a zookeeper, I was putting in so many hours where I would like, I would wake up really early, pick up some of those community service workers I was talking about, take them to the zoo, work the zoo, sometimes in the hottest parts of the summer. And then afterwards, I would take those people who I picked up back to, to, to back to where they were need, needed to be you know, dropped off, whether it be a sheriff's office or you know, other locations. And then, you know, this is high school. So I also had, also, you know, had a regular job on top of you know, that job. And so I'd, I'd go from job to job, like one after the other. So I'd, and then I'd take the company vehicle to my other job, sleep, uh, work, night shift, sleep in the parking lot, wake up and repeat the same cycle, pick up the community service workers and then take them to the zoo. And it wasn't because I had to, it was just purely for the love and the, the passion of working at a nonprofit zoo. You know, a lot of people, um, I mean, there's an incredible kind of volunteer community for animals that I've noticed. And whether that be pets or, you know, the, the different kind of zoo-like animals you're talking about. I mean, a lot of people. We have um, down here in Florida, I mean, I got a cat rescue right down the street. I got a exotic bird rescue right down the street. I mean, we have a ton of those. And, and they're non-for-profits and they're kind of... Um, heavily volunteer based so it's uh yeah we were 80 percent you're 80 percent volunteer exactly, exactly. We we're 80 percent volunteers wow what's um how long did you end up working there for so i was there from freshman year of high school to oh i think freshman year of college so around five four to five years maybe a little bit longer um towards the end we kind of we kind of got phased out by another facility that kind of took over but um that's more towards the end of the story you know more towards the end of me being there because in between there were so many different things going on uh, and i wanted to touch on something else you said the community of volunteers is so strong it is but it's also very strange it's sort of reminiscent of tiger king and you have these various characters who are like sort of like i wound up here by accident and he gave me a job now i live on this place and he feeds me and i just work with tigers all day sort of the similar thing you know, okay. we don't really yeah. deny anybody to volunteer. If you're if you're sane and you're safe and you have a good head on your shoulders, we'll take you in. And if you work your way up, I mean, by the third, fourth year, you're pretty much running the place. You're working with all the animals. But the people we had, we couldn't, you can't cure stupid. We just had people who were like, who thought differently than they should, that they need, than they would need to in a, in a, in a sort of situation they're in. They are the act first, think actor. They, uh, you know, they would make they would make a decision, a big decision, and then you know ask for forgiveness. And in this in a zoo like this, where money is literally so finite, it it really is so hard to like to to even like fix a situation where someone buys something for the zoo and go, hey, I need to be reimbursed because we did a lot of that. You know, a lot of the, the maintenance was reimbursement. You know, we had a vehicle that we purchased that was reimbursed, but it's so bad because even though we want to get rid of these people that are just not so good for the zoo in terms of like the the overall like interaction between people like just the day-to-day -day community like even though we couldn't even though they were not great we just couldn't get rid of them because we absolutely needed their hard work we needed them to be there to be doing the the, the hard work of feeding cleaning and maintaining this the, uh, the zoo uh there were days where i just i could not stand being there because of the people around but solely because we needed their help they were there. And so it wasn't a picnic all the way through. There were sort of niches that, that I fell into and even a mentor I, I had found, thankfully, and I'd stuck with them. And we kind of were a little bit higher in the totem pole up until four or five years into the, to the whole ordeal, not ordeal, like the whole experience. This zoo in Oregon, these guys were kind of shady. These guys are really shady, more shady than we are. Not We weren't shady. They were actually shady. They would take certain animals like tigers, lions, and other small cats and crazy venomous snakes, and they would pack them in a trailer, like a, a you know a, uh, those sixteen wheel tra those sixteen wheelers, those trailers, you know, those big you know, trucks. Yeah, They'd yeah. Pack them in their small cages, 
and then they tour them around the country. And they pretty much would find like carnivals, fairs, conventions, and they would put them in these like pretty much these boxes where you could see them from afar, but they were all temporary enclosures. And so for most of the year, they didn't have grass. They didn't have like a pond playing with it. They were a big cat. It wasn't until um, this zoo was shut down, sort of run out of their, their, of, their, uh, of their city in Oregon. It wasn't until then that the one tiger, uh, another another tiger, we, we had we had more tigers added to the to the zoo. Uh, he it was the first time in like ten, it was really young, seven to ten years that he had ever seen a pond that that was our that was our size, and we had a small pond. So even then, it was still like crazy to see this tiger get to play in this big bath of water for the first time. That's kind of cool. And the tiger was happy, yeah. I assume. Oh, absolutely happy! He was chuffing. Like free at last. Free at last. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah, it was no longer concrete jungle uh, for him. It, for for their facility, I remember looking up on Google Maps and seeing that it was all concrete in the facility. It was sort of smaller than ours, or it's around the same size, but it was all concrete. At least we had, you know, like plants growing through the through the dirt. Yeah. I mean, we didn't have like grass everywhere, but we had enough greenery that the, the animals weren't sort of suffering. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I can't imagine that would be nice just hanging out with concrete and metal cages and. I mean, that's got to be horrible. So that had to be, you know, seeing that tiger, one of those like fulfilling moments where you're like, okay, what I, what I do matters. Absolutely. Every day you you went home with a sense of like, of an accomplishment, what would you say, gratification or satisfaction. You went home knowing you, you didn't just do something good, but you did something that you were passionate about. And that it's like, it, it just drove, it drove me. Like there were hot days and cold winters and so many steps, you know, it was a five acre, five, six acre property. So it's like a lot of walking. It was a lot of hard work, but I never felt tired. Never, ever. It's just, a, it was a wonderful feeling you got for working here, for working there. And I wouldn't have traded that experience for anything in the world. I'm so glad I accidentally found them by, you know, online looking for volunteers. Yeah. Now, was there any kind of like dark underbelly stuff? that you'd seen or you'd seen others do or other organizations like what's kind of the i know there's a big dark side to it yeah there's a dark side to it for sure like even these big accredited zoos sort of have like chapters in their in their history where they weren't acting the right way or they hadn't known how to handle certain animals for example in some zoo in california i forgot which one exactly uh they don't use bull hooks and for 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 those of you listening what a bull hook is it's this really thick rod with a very pointy end and a hook next to it sort of sort of like sort of to prod and poke elephants it's to move them around it's sort of for safety for the for the zookeepers too if they charge you or they get you close you can poke them and they won't stab them through the thick skin but it's enough to scare them off but there was a one zoo in california and there was a fire in that area and they had to be evacuated however because of their a uh, strict rule to not use bull hooks, which is admirable for sure. Um, they couldn't evacuate their elephants. And so these elephants were left in harm's way. If the fire had, you know, potentially gotten there to the zoo, they would have been toast. They wouldn't have been moved anywhere because of their strict sort of rules as to never moving an elephant with a bull hook. And oh. there are stories. Well, that's good intention. Were... That's good intention, at least. Maybe, neg intention. maybe negligent or maybe not thinking it through all the way, but good intention. Good intention for sure, but I mean, bullhooks are mostly for safety. They're not really to like move the animals. They're just, you know, for, for your safety. But I mean, it's sort of like in a situation like that, most people would side on the would mean most people would side on the side of bullhooks. Yeah, like let's get them out no matter what it takes. Um, but there were other examples too. Like before I get to our zoo, there was another zoo where they didn't even know a red panda had died until like the, the, the carcass just fell out of the tree. I mean, they're so prone to dying from heat exhaustion during the summer. They have thick coats. Uh, so like some, some zoo just, you know, a red panda just fell out of the tree dead, decomposed, not like decomposed, but starting to decompose. Aren't those like, so, like super rare? Is that red a Red panda's super... not, thankfully they're not. Oh, not the red uh, panda. Thankfully they're not. Yes, you're thinking of the regular Chinese panda, the black and white ones. Ah, uh, I understand. Yeah, and those guys, I mean, no zoo technically owns, a, uh, you know, one of those pandas, a black and white panda. No, no one owns one. They're all property of China. And if you have one, you probably have it legally. But most zoos are all zoos. Or it's they're on loan or something. Until they're done for you. Yeah. Exactly. 
yeah, China's really adamant about having all their pandas back in the country, when, you know, after they're done breeding or whatever. So you could uh, breed a panda saying, and then have a panda at your zoo. You, you think so, but no, that baby panda is still the property oh, of China. All I pandas in the world belong to China. Yeah, it's a strict rule. It's a strict, like, all, like, if, for example, someone had a panda illegally and they surrendered it in Texas, then that panda would go straight to China. It wouldn't stay in Texas. I wonder who makes You'll never see rules. a rest. Like, where did that rule come from? China, uh, pandas were really at this brink of extinction a, a while ago. It wasn't. It wasn't until you know uh, captive breeding programs, and then you know the uh, AZA, that's the uh, association or, zoo, or the American Zoological Association. It wasn't until they stepped in and started you know, breeding them outside of the country. Additionally, that they brought the nurse back. But back then, it was like you know, if you have a panda, we want that back so bad. Like we will kill that our panda back because of how rare they are and how endangered they are. And they're impossible to breed. Really, not impossible, but they're really hard to breed. Do they exist in the wild anywhere, or no? They still do, yeah. They still play, still live in uh, in forest, in bamboo forests. I don't know exactly where in China. I'd have to, you know, look uh, look up the geography of uh, China. I imagine colder climates, higher elevation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Huh? Yeah, that's that's crazy. I know it's like the. I mean, the panda is like the poster for the World Wildlife Foundation or the World Wildlife Fund. Maybe it is. Um, yeah, they're the they're the poster child for all endangered species because they're the most like recognizable species. Yeah. It's kind of a dumb animal, uh, isn't it? Oh, hilariously dumb. Like, you can, see, find, you can find hours and hours of videos online just <laughs> seeing pandas falling out of trees, breaking, snapping bamboo, and just, like, fall into their, their early death. Klutzy pandas. They it's really are. Like I mean, the dodo bird. I'm surprised the pand- like, you know, pandas have, have gotten this far. I mean, yeah. with, of, course we, of course, we intervened, but before that, I'm, I'm surprised it got that far. And in, 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 you know, in life and down the timeline of you know species, like in terms of like how long they've, they've existed, I'm surprised that they've existed this long. Just I mean, they're not all stupid, but it's just hilariously hilarious how the stereotype sort of holds up with pandas. Yeah. Did you guys ever have a sloth? We actually did have a sloth. Uh, we had a two-toed sloth, I think. Uh, <laughs> That's a hilarious a animal. Hilarious. Animal. But they're so strong when it comes to their 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 nails, their fingers, the nails mostly. Like they're strong and they they, they can puncture you. They're it's scary if you don't have a doll's house lock because there are plenty of aggressive slots out there. Like their grip, you're talking about like their grip, basically. Yeah, their grip. Like they rely on their grip to stay alive, you know, to be hanging by trees. Yeah. They, the majority of their lifetime is to spend in the trees, so they have to hang. So those are some gnarly fingers. They're some gnarly paws, some gnarly nails. And do you guys uh, had like a I pretty did. docile sloth, you said? I never got to meet the sloth, but from the pictures and stories be, you know, from before I got there, it, it just painted pictures of a wonderful, slow little guy who just was a great ambassador to look everywhere to sort of, you know, educate you know, young people, educate kids about, you know, animals that are endangered or animals that are, you know, animals that are being threatened to endangerment because of the sloths. Their number one sort of threat is just, you know, um, deforestation down there in South America. So it's a great, it's a great learning. Tool. I wouldn't say learning tool. I'm not objectifying the end, but it's like it, it's a great sort of way to, you know, it's a hands-on way to learn. And if you're a kid, you see a slot, you get to touch a slot, that might spark an interest in being a zookeeper eventually. Yeah, no, that's true. Absolutely. I mean that that education's kind of, um, I mean that's the point of zoos, is is kind of um, educating and including the next generation of people into, you know being interested in animals and maybe trying to save them, preserve them, you know, work with them. I mean, it's a, it's kind of a treasure we have to keep around for future generations to be able to see. Exactly. We've killed, uh, as long as humans have been around, we, we've killed off so uh, such a large percentage of wildlife species just from our growth and our expansion. But um, I, I would, I would argue that the, the main purpose of any like well-intentioned zoo, accredited or not, is that they are just there as a teaching instrument, as a, as a way to educate you know the public about what's going on around the world. It's because when you walk into a zoo, you're instantly uh, looking at the world through a through a lens, you know, a lens of animals. You get to see different animals from from Africa. You get to hear stories of different communities like in Madagascar and whatnot. It's 
it's really all it's there for. I mean, other than, if you didn't have that one intention, then it would just be to have cool animals around, and that's sort of unethical. Well, and that's probably those people who illegally have tigers. Like, it's always like, hey, look, I got a tiger. Like, you exactly. see, Mike Tyson had one, right? He had one for a little I think while. he did, yeah. Yeah. And it was even, um, uh, it was even, it was even in uh, one of the, uh, one of the movies from, uh, what's that movie with Ed Helm? Fudge, uh, Hangover. It was in the Hangover. Mike Tyson's like, Tiger? Uh, oh, they kind of, yeah, right? they portrayed it or something, didn't they? Exactly, yeah. There, yeah. There's like a whole, like, there's like, there's a huge tiger scene in Vegas, too, and not just you know, private collections, you know, magicians. Uh, oh, who are those two magicians that? Siegfried and Roy. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, Siegfried and Roy. Oh, well, he thing. got he got attacked, right? He did. He got mauled on stage. Wow. And then afterwards, they took the uh, uh, it's a different approach to having tigers, and they were like, we should sort of advocate for no one having tigers in the area except for us. What we have now, we'll just keep in a sanctuary, but no one else should have tigers. So they went kind of on the on the on, they flipped they really really flipped the coin. They went from like loving tigers and using them as props in the show to going, you know what, no one should have tigers. We take this as a learning experience, and maybe down the line, this doesn't happen again. Wow. Yeah. I mean, that's. That's always kind of a weird life for an animal where you're like performing. Um, down in Florida, they used to have like, I don't know if you've ever heard that, like alligator wrestling. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm in South Florida and I mean, there's a lot of stories from way back in the day when they used to put on these like, like in a parking lot or something like an alligator wrestling demonstration. Um, <laughs> yeah. And they've, this happened a lot. I think they found that to be kind of cruel. Um, but then, you, you know, I, I think the the um, Seminole Indians are still, like, somewhat allowed to do that. Because we saw, like, I guess a demonstration. But they're all rescue alligators or nuisance alligators, they called them. So the Seminole yeah, Indians yeah, the will take what they call a nuisance alligator, which is, like, people will feed them. You know, mm-hmm. like I, I have one that lives in my pond in, in my backyard. Um, and he just kind of chills there and doesn't bother anyone. But I guess they become a nuisance once people start interacting or sometimes people feed them and then they start coming up to the houses. Yep. Which is kind of a, they, they are a nuisance. Yeah. yeah. A lot of people will feed like wildlife and, and then the wildlife will get comfortable with, with people and humans and then they'll just be around. But you can't forget alligators are dangerous. They have this super strong bite grip and they do the death roll. And if you want if you want to like survive from an alligator attack, you gotta really be strong. You really gotta fight the alligator. And their skulls are thick and if you want to penetrate it to kill it, it's entirely tough. So I mean the seminoles, it, it makes sense, you know, taking these nuisance alligators and working with them. I don't doubt the Seminoles aren't experienced, or I doubt they're, yeah, I doubt they're not experienced. I, I, I bet you they're highly educated. I mean, they're educated enough to, you know, have necessary permits to have alligators and do shows. But yeah. in that sense, I would say it's more, you know, it's sort of similar to the horse horse uh, racing or camel racing. Yeah, yeah. Or uh, like using horses for, for horse-drawn carriages in, in downtown, you know, Austin or whatever. It's... They're being used, but they're being used somewhat ethically and be definitely uh, within the confines of the law. But, um, you know, you, you still see illegal cockfights. You still see illegal alligator wrangling. You see people going out there, and, you know, picking uh, native species that, that, you know, are either endangered or they're threatened. Or even the opposite, you have people introducing non-native species that compete with the native species, destroying their population. It's just, you can be really negative, or it can be, you can be very uh, disastrous. You can be very disastrous as a human, you know, towards your environment with yeah. these animals. Like, we have such a huge influence on these animals. It's not just that we, we share we share our, our homes with them, we share our, our land with them. You know, if you said you have an alligator in your pond, where I grew up, we had coyotes, we had snakes and tarantulas. You know, we we just have to live with them. You you have a respectful you want a respectful relationship is what you want. The Seminoles they have a respectful relationship with the alligators. Well, yeah, and that was a but that was a big food source for them too. I mean, they hunted them. So, I mean, oh, they, that too. Yeah. I mean, you kind of, if you're depending on them, you, you kind of learn to respect them. 
absolutely. It's sort of like the, you know, the Native Americans and buffaloes. Yeah. You respected them. You didn't hunt them to extinction. You just you followed them. And you naturally just took, you, fo- you followed them. You, you you respected them. You, you didn't just raise them and hunt them, and kill them, just throw away everything. They used everything from the bones to the organs, to the intestines. They used everybody because they respected the animal and it died for their nourishment, for their survival. You know, it's, it's sort of a relationship they have with them. But if you just want a tiger in your backyard, that's not a relationship, in my opinion. That's just yeah. you wanting something cool to have back in your backyard to show people. Well, um, it, it is so fucking we, cool, but it's not right. I mean, it's, it, not right, it's, no, it's pretty damn cool. But It's yeah. pretty damn cool, yes. I mean, I, I never felt proud telling people I worked at a, at a zoo because our zoo, specifically, if they had asked which zoo, was sort of, you know, gross it didn't have the appeal like the san diego zoo it had it's so i never felt like proud saying i worked at the zoo but i was proud of working there because i know what i was doing and it took a lot of education to get people to understand what i was doing but when i worked at the zoo uh, you mentioned earlier uh what some of the, the nitty-gritty things have happened there some gross sort of underbelly things well i told you about what happened you know some other zoos in california but it's some major zoos but in our zoo there were instances where like because we're a nonprofit, we can't have a veterinarian on staff. And so a lot of things go sort of treated like as we go. We, we, we see an animal injured or our animals getting old and dying. We just have to wait until it gets to a critical point before we have to call on a veterinarian and pay them to either euthanize or even just anesthetize them so we can work on them. But um, there was a terrible story about one of our lions, uh, a female lion. She had gotten so old. And, you know, she started getting lethargic towards the end of it. And we kind of knew she was on her last legs. But what we didn't know is how much in pain she was. It wasn't until after she passed away, we were allowed to go into the enclosure with her. And what we saw was that she completely sort of degraded her, her elbows, her front legs. And, her, and so she had pretty much worn away the meat and the muscle and just was straight to bone. And it was a horrific sight to see. Not only that, but she had, you know, Magnets eating at her necrotic flesh, uh, and this is all like, minutes after she passed away. Like we we were done mourning, or not done. We were finishing mourning, you know, the, the main death because she was euthanized. Um, but after that, we saw what a horrific state she was in. It, it wasn't anyone's fault. It's we couldn't have, have known what she was going through. We can't go in an enclosure and poke her and see what she's going through. We have to observe her. So while yes, it was a gross scene. I, I, almost threw up for sure but um i knew at, at, the, at the end of the day that it, it's we couldn't have done anything to you know ease her pain early we, we didn't know but that's only because we didn't have the necessary resources to you know afford a veterinary on staff or on call 20 percent there are such scarier stories that happened before i got there where you'd hear uh, a, one of our, we had a couple of primates we had a couple of species of primates and uh, we had a group of well, I won't say which one specifically, because it's kind of obvious. We, we had those a lot. Um, these these monkeys just were breeding prolifically, and year after year, you'd have babies. And but one year, because we we were we weren't a concrete jungle, but we were uh, a chain link jungle. We just had chain link everywhere. So our monkeys lived in chain link enclosures, uh, and small baby monkeys are small. They can fit through that chain link, man. And so. Uh, it's hard to say. It's it's hard to believe it actually happened. But there are stories where uh, a baby monkey would, would get out out of the bounds of the fence, and the mother would anxiously or sort of like uh, quickly try to retrieve the baby, and she would just pull it from the fence, like you know, pull her. She'll put her arm, you know, outside the fence to grab her baby, and she just pull it instantly. And there were stories, or one story at least, where a uh, one baby just lost its head completely, and that wasn't our fault, but because the monkeys obviously did it to each other. However, because of the enclosure, it's sort of our fault. You know, if we had an enclosure with smaller chain link or enclosure with glass or just regular walls and nets, that wouldn't have been an issue. And so often enough, you'd see, you know, these, these sort of scary situations be a result of our inability to sort of have the, the right conditions for animals, the right, the right enclosures, the right uh, you know, veterinary treatment, it's there are stories like that, and then there are stories where, like, I can't remember. So, hyenas, female hyenas, their cloaca is, is sort of like this oblong penis shaped thing. It's not a penis per se, but it looks like a penis, it sort of acts like a penis. But 
I guess you first I've, I've that never paid attention. attention to that. Oh, believe me, you'll see female hyenas having bigger penises than male hyenas. It's a predominantly uh, matri- is it matriarchal, matriarchal sort of uh, yeah, species where the females are, are stronger and they're more, you know, they're, they're, they're higher up in the totem pole than the males are. But uh, so we had a female hyena and she passed away and we just didn't know what happened to her. Oh, she just up and went, passed away. But then as we got closer, we noticed that, oh, she had actually given birth and she had died giving birth. So some hyenas have complications with, you know, giving birth because they're giving, they're giving birth to this, like, this penis, this shaft-like sort of cloaca, or not cloaca, this, this uh, shaft-like, um, what's the word for females uh, and anatomy down there? That's the, the female. Man, I'm lost on that. Vagina. There you go. Yeah, I'll just say vagina for, for layman's terms. It's just, it's, it's like this penis-shaped vagina, magic. And so they give birth to that, and often sometimes they die because it's just a painful and it's a, it's a horrific sight. But they didn't know what happened until after they got an enclosure with the dead hyena, and they see a baby hyena lying on the ground. And that's when they go, okay, now we know why they died. But wouldn't you like to know why they died beforehand or what led up to them dying? And I just had animals dropping dead. We lost all our zebras within like a couple months. We had three zebras, and one by one, they just dropped dead, and we have no clue as to why. We still don't know why. I, we didn't know why years after. Wow. What yeah. any so thoughts, was theories? Was it like the water, bacteria, some kind of illness, communicable disease? Like it, it couldn't have been the water. We have such a, a good well, but it could have been the feed from what we from what we heard. Because we buy feed. We don't just like buy what a lot of us do is buy their feed specifically, like from a distributor or from like a, a company called Missouri Diet. We just got our feed from the nearest feed store. Or for the for the zebras more specifically, their their feed came from a distributor, but it was like sort of one batch for every six months. So we had the, we had it stocked up for a while, and so it could have been the feed, but it also could have just been the ground. There could have been things growing or just bacteria in the dirt. Um, we just every after one passed away, we we're like, okay, that's sort of a weird incident. It's nothing to worry about. But then when the second one passed away, we we're like, okay, really got to reconsider how we're feeding them and how we're watering them make sure they're not stressed out. And then third one passed away and we were like, you know what? We can't do anything about it anymore. We're out of zebras. It's, yeah, that's... You're, you're... Oh, sorry. And then you just weren't doing any more after that. No, it's like, why? It, 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 it's, it's Why go through the trouble of getting more zebras when we can put something else there? Or make the... Sort of break down the wall in between that enclosure and the one with the other species, like our zebus, which are these cows... That we can give them more space and then also, you know, have to not worry about you know, having all these animals to feed. You know, it's sort of a, a few less mouths to feed. But at, at a young age, around, you know, 16, 17, or 14, 15, uh, me as a young, a young, uh, young te- or as a young adult, I had to quickly become acquainted with death because death was a common occurrence. It's actually on the application. How do you handle death? Just ask the question. The application you take. And I, I'm like, I'm cool with, you know, animals dying. I've seen I've seen the aftermath of a couple of horses dying because we had, we grew up with horses, but you know I didn't it didn't prepare me for what would happen because month after year after year because I've been there for a while I had seen all these animals die so I have this sort of not indifference but I have a respectful indifference towards you know to death now and it, it freaks out my friends when they when they talk about death and when someone close to them dies to me it's I trained myself or I just I just was I was raised in an environment where death was sort of commonplace you know, animals die. That's for all zoos, not just ours. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's, and there's different lifespans, and obviously, not most of them don't live as long as humans. I mean, most animals, just in general. Yeah, most animals don't. Like tigers have 20 years tops in captivity, or 20 years, sorry, 20 years tops in captivity and like 10 years or 12 years in the wild. It's oh. rare for an old, yeah, for an lion to get really old. Like, it's, it's so rare that, when a female lion gets so old, they actually start, they stop producing uh, estrogen and they start to produce testosterone. It's just what I was, what I was told. And it makes sense because, um, uh, you know, you know, those beautiful manes you see male lions with you know, that stuff, that big, beautiful mane. Well, that's, that could make sense if that was produced by testosterone, that all male lions have it because of their testosterone. Well, our lioness got so old, you know, because she was treated very well you know, from the beginning. She uh, grew a mane. So it's kind of rare for a female to grow a lion's mane. And so wow. 
that's just kind of being a show yeah. how old she got. It's good on our part. Kind of the, the process on aging. Exactly. It's beautiful. And uh, I, I was lucky to, to grab a lock of her hair the day she passed away. Um, but when it comes to working at a zoo, you have to be, when it comes to having any, whether you own a dog or a cat, you just, you just have to be comfortable with the idea that they might die, but they're going to die someday, probably sooner than you. Yeah. So after, you know, having this experience and seeing all these things, what's kind of your, I guess, final thought or your, your lessons or your prognosis on the, I guess, the future of keeping animals and protecting animals and, you know, I guess the whole zoo business, what's your, is it, it seems like funding's a problem, obviously. It's the biggest problem when it comes to any yeah. zoo. It's, the funding. it's, it's not the care because there's a lot of people that care and that would help, but you know, funding. Absolutely. Who, who wouldn't want to take an opportunity to, to work with a tiger or a lion? Yeah. So who would say no to that opportunity? It's really just the money to feed the tiger, to, to house the tiger, to keep the facility running. But your question was, what's the takeaway for zoos and, and their sort of like existence? I think for as long as we, for as long as humans are going to be around, zoos are going to be absolutely necessary because as our population gets bigger, we'll expand into different environments, some places that may not be protected forever, uh, like the Amazon rainforest or even different parts of Africa. Um, so I believe that zoos play a critical role in education, but also in propagating species that are endangered or you know, critically endangered. Like who, it's like if we can avoid having, for example, um, Trying to think like elephants, if we can avoid having them go extinct, we should try our, our hardest. You know, or rhinos, rhinos are the biggest one. If you often see rhinos being hunted for their ivory and their like populations are decimated, we've seen some subspecies of rhino go extinct in our lifetime just from the poaching. So, zoos play such a critical role in, in propagating the species, whether they're in or out of the country, they're, they're from. But at the same time, it's only people who, who know how to and have the the credentials and the education to take care of animals should be the one taking care of animals. I mean, as a young kid growing up, I, I, I didn't know, you know what the laws or rules were in my city or regulations. I didn't know what they were until I started working at a zoo because every year I'd be going down to the the, commission, the, the county commission, county commissioner's office or whatever you call that, you know, or pretty much our city hall and, and fighting on, on behalf of, you know, advocating for zoos. But it's the, the, the roles they play in society, even if you're just a young kid like me, it, it, it opened me up to a whole other world. It opened me, it opened me up to the entire world. You know, I wouldn't be so knowledgeable about these species had I not worked for five years. And it was such a an incredible experience that I would want for anybody to have, whether they're you know already an adult or whether they're young. It's never too late to get into anything. You can always be a zookeeper. And you're doing a great thing. You're, yeah. you're, you're helping educate the future about these animals that may not be around for well, um, it's definitely important work and there's a lot of people out there that are interested and I'm sure there could be more, but you know, we thank you for coming on and sharing the story and talking about it and educating our listeners. And it's, it's something that a lot of people don't know a lot about, uh, how it is to operate those from the inside and maybe they don't understand the funding shortfalls and, you know, people hear this and this gets out you know, maybe they start participating more and paying a little bit more attention to wildlife rescue and animal and zoos and stuff like that. So we appreciate you coming on. No worries. Thank you for having me on, Matt. I really appreciate this opportunity. All right. Thanks. The Redacted Podcast is produced by myself, Matt Bender, and my wife, Pamela Bender. Make sure to go out there and give us a like, a share, share it with your friends, rate us. Every little bit helps. Thanks for tuning in.